Okay. So once again, uh, this week's topic is the funeral service and uh, houses of mourning. Um, you can see I changed my virtual background to the cemetery. Uh, I don't mean this to be morbid or anything, but uh, it's better than just a blurred screen. It gives you a little uh, little sight. This is our, the picture behind me is uh, is from the old section of our cemetery in Queens, Beth Olam Cemetery, Sheriff Israel Cemetery. Uh, that cemetery is uh, dated from 1851. It continues to be an active cemetery for our congregation. Uh, but the section that you're looking at behind me with these very big monuments, that is in an older section and almost all of those burials that you see behind me are from the mid 19th century uh, and not current. Um, not that someone wanted to have such a big monument, they could, uh, but <laughs> it'd be pretty rare these days. Um, the, the the outline for today uh, again I, I this I, I said it before we start recording I said I'll say it again just for for posterity for everyone to know uh, this topic could be very very large uh, and it could be a course on its own the funeral service and the house of mourning customs of mourning uh, we're not going to go through every detail we're not going to go through the explanation of every prayer uh, but I'm going to just give a, a little overview of the Spanish and Portuguese traditions. For the funeral service and for services held in the Beit Abel in the House of Mourning. So the first thing to know <coughs> is that um, there was a flurry of publishing activity uh, here at Sheretz Israel at the beginning of the 20th century. And the books that they published we still use today. They're, they're guidebooks and handbooks. They're very useful and uh, I'm going to show you some of them right now. Um, all of these books were published by the congregation's burial society called the Hebra Chassid Va'amet. The Hebra Chassid Va'amet is uh, not only a burial society, it's also a philanthropic organization that uh, provides for burial of the indigent. In fact, that's, it's, it's, uh, it was formed, I think, in 1805 um, when members of Sheriff Israel uh, observed that there was a burial of someone, a stranger, they didn't know, going on in Potter's Field. This is in Manhattan in 1805. And they inquired whose burial it was. Turned out it was a Jewish person. And so they stopped the procession, brought him to the Sheriff Israel Cemetery, did a tahara, buried him there, and decided they needed a, a independent organization uh, so they could bury uh, um, uh, those who were not connected to the congregation and didn't automatically um, become a part of the Jewish community of New York City. Um, and so that is founded, it was founded with burial of, of strangers to the community and, and the indigent who didn't otherwise have a place. Uh, but today it's still active. Uh, and my mother is the president of it. Just, to, just, just she's, she's here on the call right now. <laughs> um, uh, it is, uh, it was, uh, it was and is a very active organization, uh, but in the early 20th century, it had a flurry of publication. The first one is 1910. So you hear the burial service. We still use this booklet at the cemetery. It has some interesting parts. I'm going to show you a little bit about it later. Then there was a handbook for Tahara. Tahara is the ritual preparation of the deceased for burial. Um, it's washing and dressing, basically. Uh, and there's a little booklet about that. It was published in 1913. Again, we follow, uh, we follow it to this day. And then there is something that's really, really useful, but hard to find nowadays, called the Mourner's Handbook, Makor Chaim, which was published in 1915, uh, which uh, has uh, customs of mourning, laws and customs of mourning uh, in the Sephardic tradition, uh, published by our community. The authors were uh, Reverend Henry Pereira Mendes, as well as his junior uh, a rabbi of the congregation, David de Sola Pool. And that was published in 1915. If you have copies of these, hold on to them. Uh, they're valuable. I think they're valuable anyway. They're valuable to me, uh, but they're useful and still, still used uh, in the congregation. Now, some of you, one of the reasons I'm doing this topic tonight 
is because for the last two years, um, funerals have been different. Um, it used to be all the time that most funerals took place in the funeral home. I mean, this is nowadays, not, not historically. We're going to see that as well. Funerals took, took place in a funeral home, and then there, you know, especially large ones. Then you'd go to the cemetery for a burial. Uh, but with COVID, most, most funerals these days take place at the cemetery. In rare instances, sometimes I've been to a few outdoor services here at Sheridan Sh Israel, a few, a few funerals in the funeral home from our congregation, but not many. People don't want to gather unnecessarily indoors. More um, affected, uh, damaged maybe by, by COVID has been uh, visiting people during Shiva. It used to be, and still is, and it still can be, and still will be, that the mourner stays at home during the week of mourning, and people come visit them in their home. But with COVID, especially now, and certain points when it was really difficult, nobody wanted people coming to their home. Um, and so virtual shiva and all sorts of other things have taken the place of uh, what normally would take place in the home. One of the things that takes place in the home, or should, are services. Now, interestingly, this booklet, the Mourner's Handbook, <coughs> was basically published for that purpose. And it has in it Mincha and Arbi. And in our congregation, it was, and to a certain extent still is, common that uh, mourners will have in the home the evening services, Mincha and Arbi. Uh, or maybe if it's, uh, if it's wintertime, maybe they'll just have Arbi. And they'll go to the synagogue for the other services, for morning, morning services in particular, M-O-R-N. Um, uh, be, be for a lot of reasons, one is, but one of the main ones is that uh, there is a custom not to loan out a Sefer Torah unless it will be read from three times. And so in many Batei Abel, it won't, that won't happen. And so uh, uh, Sefer Torah will not be there. And so morning services uh, should be taking place in uh, the synagogue in any case. So other communities, they have special Sefer Torah that go to the house of mourning. And they make sure that they have every service morning, uh, but here at Jared Israel, and I don't, it's, not a, it's not a real minhag, but the culture was uh, that the evening services were held in the home, the morning services, the mourners would come to the synagogue. Um, and so this booklet has in it printed minchan arbit, but not shafri. Okay. Um, so I want to I wanna show you each of these books a little bit and take you through, through them a little bit. Uh, I want to start off with uh, uh, the funeral service today. We would say that it happens in the funeral home, but I want to show you what the, the opening of this uh, service is in the older books, the, the Makor Chaim handbook I was just showing you. It says the funeral service in the house. Why is that? Because back in the early 20th century, there were no funeral homes, or if they were, they, they operated differently. We're talking about 1910, 1915, 1900. I don't know how old Riverside is. It's probably around that old, but- uh, 1897. The, 1897, really? Okay, so they were, yeah. they were new though. Exactly, they were new. But the same year you guys moved to the Upper West Side is when we came into existence in, low, in the Lower East Side. In the Lower East Side, got it. Thank you, Joel. Um, so, uh, my point being is that before the rise of funeral homes, the livaya, the accompanying of the deceased to burial, started in the home. The home is where the chebra, the burial society, would come and prepare the body for burial. And they would remove the body from the home and go directly to the cemetery for burial. Um, and this is reflected here in this book from 1915, The Funeral Service in the House. Um, nowadays, we have the, uh, the service in a funeral home, mo most, more, more or less. And when we, when we do so, we have these introductory verses. I don't know how many of you have been to Israel funeral services. This is the way they start. The, the Chazan will read these verses. There is no chance. Everybody's going to be 
מלימודי מלחמה, איש חרבו על ירחו מפחד בלילות. These verses have nothing to do with burial or the deceased. Why do we recite them? The easy cop-out answer which I have been told is, oh, they are Kabbalistic. I have no idea if that's true. I think that's an easy answer to say, I don't know. Um, this will require a larger class to go through them. If you go through them, there are, there are certain uh, themes in them. Uh, and I don't think they're Kabbalistic. I think they have uh, maybe a little bit having to do with strength of, 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 the, of, the, uh, of the people who are there or the deceased. But um, one of the things you'll find interesting, the, the top left of your screen is uh, David Asola Poole's prayer book, the Daily and Sabbath prayer book. You go to the back, the funeral service. Um, you can see here the Hebrew. These are verses from Tanakh. Um, but he, <laughs> he translates completely different verses. <laughs> These verses here are not what's written in the Hebrew <laughs> because Dr. Poole realized that he wanted the, the, the verses to reflect something about funerals, the deceased, the uh, afterlife, going to, from dust to dust, ashes to ashes. None of that is in these introductory verses here in the Hebrew. So uh, Dr. Poole took some, li uh, some liberties in his translation. Now, if you go back to the earlier book, you will see that they added a little line here that says paraphrase. I don't know if you can see that. It's maybe, I don't know if it's big enough for you to see on the screen, but it says paraphrase. But this is actually pretty much a translation with some added, uh, added uh, explanation. We're not going to get too much detail in it, uh, but if you ever pick up the uh, Makor Chaim, the name of the book, the Mourner's Handbook from Sherath Israel, uh, you can get a little bit of explanation about some of these verses. Uh, one of them that's really the most strange, though, is God gedud yigudenu, who you yagud akev. This is a verse from the end of Genesis when Jacob is giving blessings to the, his 12 sons, to the 12 tribes. Sort of a, a prophecy for the end of days or you know, about the nature of the tribes, the nature of his children. And this is the one for, for his son God, for the tribe of God. And God gedud yigudenu has to do with troops and armies. But you can see that the, the translation he did here, O destiny, thou thyself art destined. May the destiny of this one be reward. Uh, that's definitely not literal, but um, I don't know what to make of it. Re again, re this will require a whole nother, whole nother uh, class to go through exactly why we're saying these verses. But anyway, this is not done at the funeral. If you, if you have a graveside service, these verses are not read. These are read in the home or in the funeral home right before we have the 23rd Psalm. 23rd Psalm, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not, uh, I shall not want. Uh, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Probably the most famous uh, Psalm, people know it by heart in English or in Hebrew. Um, uh, that is the opening of almost every funeral service, both in Ashkenazim and Sephardim. And after these introductory verses, that's what's done here as well. Most of the time the rabbi will read it in Hebrew and or in English without any special chant. Occasionally people will want it to be sung or chanted uh, and there's no minhag about that either. Then in the funeral home, at least there'll be uh, eulogies at that point. Uh, if it's especially if it's a day where you can have eulogies, other days you might be quicker about it. Um, and then they have these uh, concluding verses. Again, these verses don't have to do with funerals or anything, but they do have to do with movement of the aron. The, the casket is called an aron. So uh, these verses are read right before you exit the home or right before you exit the funeral home. I'm going to share, uh, let's see here, I have to do a little bit of a different share. Uh, just to stop this here and try to switch it to. Okay, we're going to get a little more into the liturgy, little, little customs of liturgy. Um, when you go to, can you see my screen? Just a nod yes to somebody? Okay, good. So these concluding verses, when, before you move the, um, uh, before you move the casket, uh, they have this, uh, again, they're chanted by the Chazan without a special melody. 
על כפי מסעונך פן תגוף באבן רגליך, לא תאונה אליך רעה, ונגן לא יקרב בעולך, איש מלחמה, אדוני איש מלחמה, אדוני שמור. And then you say this last verse three times, אדוני ילחם לכם ואתם תחרישון. Now here is a very unknown custom, <coughs> which was taught to me, uh, and is the, is the way that we teach all the chazanim. When you say this verse three times, each time you have a different emphasis. Adonai yilachem lachem v'yatem tacharishum. Adonai yilachem lachem v'yatem tacharishum. Adonai yilachem lachem v'yatem tacharishum. I should actually say the first time you emphasize Adonai, the Lord will, will fight your battles for you. And then the second time you emphasize lachem, the Lord will fight your battles for you. And then there'll be the Lord will fight for you and you will be silent. Why that is done, I don't know, but that is the minhag. Dare anyone change it. And then uh, we proceed to the uh, cemetery. Now, uh, I want to show you. Can you still see my screen? Yes? No? Okay. Our cemetery in Queens uh, is uh, it's located on the border of Brooklyn and Queens. And um, in the old days, they had to take a ferry across the East River to get there. You know, the cemetery was opened in 1851. There was no, there were no bridges, there were no cars. Uh, you'd have to load the, the hearse was a horse drawn uh, and they would go on a ferry. And uh, yeah, if it was this weather in the winter, uh, yeah, you had to dress warmly. Uh, but also I could imagine that they didn't have very big funerals with lots of people at the cemetery very frequently because, especially in the winter anyway, because it was very, very hard to get to. Um, in any event, we have a chapel out there. Uh, this is a picture of it in the center of your screen. Let's see if I can make it a little bigger. Uh, okay. Uh, this is called the Metaher House. Z, we, don't means... see, we don't see the, uh, the, the image. What are you looking at? We're looking at Kimala uh, Chav Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Let's see here. Can you see it now? Okay, thank you. So in the center here, this is the, uh, the chapel at the cemetery. It dates from the 1880s. Um, it was, uh, there was an earlier house there that was called the Metaher House, which meant that was where they prepared the bodies for burial, meaning they would wash them and dress them and put them inside a ca casket right there at the cemetery. Then in 1885, they built this chapel. This chapel was made by Calvert Vox. Calvert Vox was one of the designers of Central Park and Prospect Park, pretty famous uh, landscape architect from the 19th century. It's an old chapel, <clears throat> not very large, but we still use it, as uh, Mr. Simon knows very well. We still use it uh, once or twice a year. Someone will request to uh, have a graveside service, uh, and maybe it's raining, so we use the chapel, or maybe they have an affinity for the chapel, so we use it. Um, it this is my call to you. Uh, if you want to be involved in a project with me, uh, multi-year planning, we have to, this, this chapel is a, is a gem, uh, but requires uh, some rehabilitation. So uh, uh, one day we'll get to that. M another long-term project for the synagogue to deal with. Uh, there's no electricity there. So if you take a look at the picture on the left, there are string lights that are strung uh, up with a generator outside in order to provide lighting inside the, inside the chapel. There are, if anyone can figure out how to light them, candles on these chandeliers, beautiful, amazing antique chandeliers, which are not used uh, at all. But you can see, here's Rabbi Road at a, uh, at a memorial service we held a number of years back. We do have these wonderful candelabra in the front uh, that we do use as well. This is where uh, uh, funeral services were held and are held from our congregation uh, since the 1880s. Um, this is also what is the instructions of the booklet. I'm going to have to switch booklets again, but for the burial service are made to go along with this chapel. And uh, we're going to get to some of the singing very soon. But um, what happens is everyone gathers here. The Aron, the, uh, the casket is brought into the uh, chapel. Certain uh, prayers are said, which we're going to get to, called Hakafot. 
uh, if there's any speeches that'll happen at this point here. And then uh, if you can see on this top left picture, there were our doors here. Now we don't use these anymore, but back in the earlier period, uh, those doors would be opened. The women would stay here in the chapel. The men would accompany the casket through those doors, right out the back. This is the other side of the, of the uh, chapel, coming out this door here. Uh, and uh, up and right to the burial. They would do the burial as quickly as possible, return to the chapel for the Tidu Kaden, which we're going to sing, and for the Kaddish uh, before going back home uh, and to the Beit Abel. That's the general structure of funeral services at Sheretz Israel. So the, the chapel house, the, uh, the entire house is part of the, the, uh, the, the, the liturgy in some ways because Women stayed in it. At uh, some earlier date, uh, women were considered, uh, or, or funeral services were considered too emotional for women to, uh, to be participating in the burial part. We don't do that nowadays. Now everyone comes and participates in the burial. Um, once in a while, we'll get an old time family that will, uh, will stay in the chapel or, or the women won't participate in the burial part. Uh, but most, most funerals these days, men and women participate equally. Okay. Now we'll get to some singing. So the uh, feature, one of the main features uh, of Sherith Israel's uh, uh, funeral service is called hakafot. Uh, there is a Spanish word for those. They're called rodeamentos. Uh, they're circuits uh, where we uh, walk around the casket seven times uh, and chant a special song, special poem. Uh, I'm going to switch the share. The, screen share here so you can see the liturgy. And I had a hard time trying to figure out which one to show you because the translations are a little different. So uh, I'm going to start you off with the Rodeo Mentos as in Dr. Poole's book, which is a little less literal, uh, but a little, little nicer translation. It's, it, it's Unlike, uh, unlike the verses, they do connect to what the Hebrew says. Just may not be able to work out each word uh, perfectly. Um, I have a special melody, which is also shared by Silichot on Yom Kippur. <clears throat> and if you haven't been to a funeral service in Sherat Israel, you still may have heard the melody uh, if you have been to Yom Kippur at Sherat Israel. Um, on the morning of Yom Kippur, there is a... Uh, uh, the Cha or an uh, introduction to Nishmad and the Shachrit. Uh, it's called Bikor E Aneni. Elohim Eliata Ashacher Kabeso Sigulatecha Emunatecha Odiang Vagid Gedulatecha Bikor E Aneni Tomakum Bekerepilatecha Adonai Sifatai Tisa. That comes from the morning of Yom Kippur. And that goes right before Nishmat. So uh, that poem goes into Nishmat Kol Chai Tibarech Et Shimcha Adonai Eloheinu and so on. <coughs> this is the same melody that is used at the Beit Abel. And while sometimes I think the uh, funeral liturgies come from other you know, the, the, the Sidur, in this case, I think the Kippur melody is coming from the Hakafot, uh, because I think they are the, it's a conscious association with the end of life. When you're on Kippur, you should be thinking about Yom Hadin and, uh, and those things. And this is the melody that is used. It gets you in the uh, thinking about funerals. It's uh, kind of uh, on purpose. So here's how it sounds. Ra, I, I, if you can, I, Someone let me know that you are looking at the Rodeo Mentos on the screen, right? See, see it on the screen? Okay, great. Rachem nangalav el Elohim chayim umelech olam kigimecha mekor chayim betamid yitalech be'artzot ha'chayim betanuach nafsho bitzror ha'chayim And so on. I won't do all seven verses, but this last line <coughs> is the refrain that goes in between each uh, each section. 
Vita Miditale Biar Sota Haim Vitanu Achnav Show Hitror Um that the deceased should forever uh, uh re- walk in the in the uh in the uh in the places of life in the land of life and his soul should rest in the bonds of life. And it's a nice, it's a nice image. It's a nice words, nice rhyme, and it's a beautiful melody. And it's a custom that I hope to preserve. And I say that because um, people have stopped doing them. People don't ask for them so much, and we don't do them automatically anymore. It used to be that uh, we always did hakafot, but uh, 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 from the late '80s, early '90s until today, we only do them when people ask for them. So. I think it's a particularly nice custom, and uh, I like to upkeep it. Uh, it's very, very Spanish Portuguese. Now, the reason that some people don't like to do them is, uh, for whatever reason, it's only uh, it's only done for men. It's not done for women. Uh, and so, uh, previous minister decided that that was not right, and why should there be a difference? There is no real difference. And so he said, "Well, let's not do them." Um, if if it were me, if I was the rabbi at that time. I would have said the other way around. I said, let's do them for women, but nobody asked me. So anyway, <laughs> um, this is the, the Hakafot service. Now, uh, occasionally uh, it is done uh, when Ram Cardozo passed away, he had a funeral in the, in the synagogue uh, and we did Hakafot for him in the synagogue. Uh, that has been done on, on rare occasions uh, for uh, basically for ministers of the congregation. Uh, to do them inside the synagogue. And so when you talk to someone about hakafot, it's not only Simchat Torah. Simchat Torah have a certain kind of hakafot, a little different. See, but these are the real older hakafot. Spanish Portuguese didn't have hakafot on Simchat Torah until 1950, 1954 or so. But these hakafot go much further back. So if you're talking about hakafot, talking about the cemetery. Okay. All right, thank you, Mark. Um, so, let's go a little, a little further. Uh, a few more customs from the cemetery, but then I'm gonna move to the, the house of mourning. <clears throat> when the casket is lowered, we say this verse, we use the melody from Tisha B'Av. And as we'll find out in a few minutes, that melody is also known as the Beit Abel melody, the house of mourning melody. Sounds like this. And then when the burial is done as much as possible by the participants there, hopefully there's a lot of participants there and you get to do the whole thing on your own. If there aren't, if there aren't enough people to do it on your own, then there are always grave diggers who can help finish the job. Um, I'm going to give you another insider custom that very few people know about. At every funeral in our cemetery, the officiant, often me or Rabbi Rode or Rabbi Soloveitchik or Rabbi Angel, uh, right during the actual burial part, will say, he's supposed to say it loud and announce it, but usually says it kind of quietly, a kibura hazot. He al tenai. This burial is conditional, and the reason for that is kind of unusual um, and very unique to Sharet Israel. Uh, the background is that in uh, in halacha, once someone has been buried, they are not supposed to be removed and disinterred and moved anywhere from their final resting place, except under very few permissible circumstances. One of those is to be with their family if they were buried uh somewhere and but their whole family is in a different city you can later on uh move them uh similarly you can move them to go to eretz israel <clears throat> but there are very few instances where you are supposed or permitted to do that unless one of them is if you announced ahead of time that you can and you intend to and unfortunately for Sherat israel in the long history of our congregation there have been uh, several incidents, beginning with uh, 
um, the taking of part of 11th Street in order uh, to build 11th Street from our second cemetery. Later on, taking part of our first cemetery in order to build the Bowery, to extend the Bowery down to St. James Place, where parts of our cemetery were taken by eminent domain. The city, city took the land and forced us to disinter bodies and remove them to a new, new place. Uh, later on, uh, uh, there, were, there were also, uh, there was an unfortunate lawsuit uh, that took place in the uh, early 20th century where someone wanted to move uh, someone who had been buried at Sheretz Israel, and the congregation said, eh, it's against Allah, we're not going to do it. We went to the New York State Court of Appeals, the synagogue lost the case, they had to disinter the body and move it to where the family wanted it. Um, and as a result of all of these incidents, every burial done at Sheretz Israel is considered al Tanai. And I'm telling you this now, making an announcement in case I ever forget to do it at the cemetery, Joel, every burial is conditioned. Okay, but that's part of the rules, part of the minhag. You say, Akibura hazoti al Tanai. Okay, then this is, this is, I mean, I don't know if anybody does this. You have this verse, This is a verse that comes from uh, Egla Rufa or whatever. Not, um, yeah, that when you have, when you find a body uh, in, uh, in the Torah and you don't know what happened to it, they measure which city was closest to it. They bring out the elders. The elders say, we didn't cause this person's death. Um, and it's a, it's a verse in the Torah. And uh, the, the custom is to say this verse when you return after the burial to the, to the Matahir house, to the, to the chapel for the end of the service, you say this, uh, you wash your hands and say this, this verse. We don't do it much today um, for a lot of reasons, but uh, we don't, that, that's part of the custom that we, we don't really do much today. <clears throat> okay, now I'm going to tell you, this is, we're getting towards the end. We're going to do Tzidu Kadin, uh, which is the, uh, the, 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 the justification of the divine decree. This is uh, the, the, the meat of the burial service. This and the, and the memorial prayer of the Hashkabah. The Tzidu Kadin is a prayer that, uh, that is said that the mourners are supposed to understand that even though they are in mourning um, and it's terrible, they have to accept the judgment of God. That God is doing everything is under God's plan. There is a, you know, some people have long lives, some people have short lives, some people have happy lives, some people have difficult lives. We don't know why. We have no idea. That's in the hand of God. God is, and God is, and we trust that God is righteous. Uh, and and uh, that's part of a, sort of the philosophy of Judaism. And so this is uh, the meat of the of the of the funeral service. And it sounds like. Sadik ata Adonai, the Asha Mispatecha, Sadik Adonai Beho de Rahab, Behasi Beho Mangasa, Vikateha Terek Lingolam, Petora Teha Emet, Mispete Adonai Emet, Sadeku Yakav. And we have to turn the page. Basher devar melech shilton, umi yomar lo matanga se, behu be'echad umi shibenu, v'nafsho ibeta vayangat. Hatsur tamim pangolo, kichol deracha mishpat, el emuna ve'enavel, sadik v'yasharu. Dayan emet, shofet tzedek ve'emet. Baruch dayan ha'emet, ki chol mishpatav, tzedek ve'emet. It's actually a beautiful melody for beautiful verses. Um, and we say them all week. We say them here at the cemetery. We say them every single day in the house of mourning, at the end of shachrit, and at the end of our beat. Uh, so uh, Ashkenazim don't have that custom, and other Sephardim don't even have that custom. That's really a Spanish-Portuguese custom to say, Tidu Kadin, every day, at every service. And then that goes into the memorial prayer, which I'm not going to do for you today because I have done done it a lot, and I think most of you have heard it before. Um, but that is the Hashkabah that is recited. And then we have this um, paragraph that introduces the Kaddish. 
We say two Kaddishim at uh, the cemetery. One is just for the immediate mourners, a special burial Kaddish, and it is introduced by these verses. Bilang hama vedla netzach, umacha adonai Elohim dina mengal kol panim, dekher pat namo yasir mengal kol haaretz ki adonai diber, yichyu meitecha nebelati yikumun, hakitsu veranu shokhenen afar, kita lo rota lecha, baaretz rifayim tapil, dehurachum yichapeng avon, velo yashkit, vihir bala shiv apo, and then you have this very special Kaddish, which uh, people who think they know how to say Kaddish will jump into and then realize very quickly that they don't. <laughs> it is not a not so simple, not so familiar word. Thank God for most of us, it's not familiar. Um, but uh, it's about it's about the revival of the dead and the building of Jerusalem, uh, and it's a very old Kaddish actually. It's uh, it's, uh, it's very very old. Uh, if you read Dr. Poole's book on the Kaddish, you can read the history of it. Uh, and then when that's done, we recite in Shemitah Israel what's called the eleven month list, which is a memorial prayer for everyone who was buried in the cemetery within the last year, essentially. We're saying Kaddish for. And then another Kaddish is said by everyone or anyone who wants to say Kaddish. Uh, which is a regular Yehoshua Lama Kaddish. Uh, and that is introduced by verses as well. And these are here at the top. Um, yeah. And then, uh, and then the regular Kaddish by anyone who wants to say it. And that is the end of the funeral service, which concludes with two, two more things. One is uh, the Chazan says, Charity saves from death. I don't know if that works in every case, but that is the last. Uh, appeal basically i mean it's not not the synagogue putting their hand out for a handout but maybe it is i don't know exactly why we say that at the end of a funeral service uh, i once uh, saw and got a little upset about uh, uh at a moroccan uh, a moroccan family had a funeral in our cemetery and uh it was being led by a moroccan rabbi which is unusual usually we have our own clergy uh, performing the, the liturgy for its for very reason. We, you know, we were we're makpid, we're we're zealots about our own customs. Uh, but uh, in one case, we had a Moroccan rabbi performing a funeral at the cemetery, and they have a very similar liturgy till the end. Here, they they say tzedakata tumavet, and they throw money on the grave. Kind of crazy. <laughs> they they put something out, they throw money on the grave. I, I got a little upset at that. I had to walk away at that point and just uh, didn't want to upset anybody. But uh, but yeah, so different customs for different 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 strokes for different folks. But same idea. Uh, and then the family goes home. The other thing that is different in Sheriff Israel, uh, most communities will line up the attendees in two rows on either side, and the mourners will walk through and they will uh, uh, console the mourners. With the phrase "Min Hashamayim Tinuchamu," or Ashkenazim say "Hamakom Yinachem Etchem B'Toch Shahar Avelei Tzion Yerushalayim," that's the Ashkenazic phrase. They will the, the the assembled guests will console the mourners on their way out of the cemetery. Charitoso doesn't do that. Uh, they, they you go home to console the mourners. They don't the, after this. There's no official anything, but usually everyone greets the mourners with "Min Hashamayim Tinuchamu" at that point. And then they go home. There's something called uh, a special but special meal, which we can talk about another time in my in my another class that will we, I'm predicting many times today, uh, which we'll have to do about Abelut. Uh, but what I want to do for you today before we close is uh, some of the psalms that we recite uh, before the prayers. In one particular, the psalm that's recited before the Arbit. So uh, I hope that one day. Uh, I hope that one day we will be able to um, 
um, have normal, uh, when, unfortunately, this shouldn't happen too frequently, but when there are mourners, you should be able to console them in their home as, as is proper. Um, because we really haven't been able to do that all that much during, uh, during COVID. Uh, and and it's, uh, I think we're missing something of community uh, that occurs when you have an in-person shiva, when you have in-person services, people gather together uh, and you really feel uh, consoled by the whole community. I think on the, at the same, to same time, I think Zoom visitation is here to stay. Uh, well after COVID, I think we will always be having certain virtual uh, uh, visitation hours because it allows people to come from all over the world <clears throat> who wouldn't otherwise be able to greet the mourners. <clears throat> In any event, there is another uh, psalm that's recited at the introduction of the RB service. And the reason I want to sing it for you today is, A, it's a nice psalm, but also the melody used is not used for anything else. It's only used here in the house of the mourner. And it sounds, uh, and so it's unique. You know, there is a whole liturgical calendar in the, in the Spanish Portuguese Minhag from the beginning of the year to the end of the year and every holiday has a different melody and a different mood. Um, but here is one prayer that has its own melody that we don't use for anything else. And uh, it goes like this. La <clears throat> Shimu zot kol hangamim, ha'azinu ko yoshebe chaled. Gam b'nei adam, gam b'nei ish, yachad nashir ve'ebyon. Hi yidaber chokmot, ve'agud libi tibunot. Atele mashal ozni, efkach bechinor chidati. Lama ira bimeirang, Navona ke bayis tu beni, abote him al helam, ubrob moshramit alalu, achlo fado iste ish, lo ite ne lo him kofro, vie carpidio nasham, ve hadal nengolam, vihingola neta, lo yir e Kiir echa chamim yamutu yachar kesil vabangar yobedu vengazebu laacherim chelam kir bambate mo vengolam nishkenotam ledor vador kar ubis motam nale adamot ve adam bikar bal yalin. Nimshal ka behemot nidmu Zedar kam kesel amo Viacharehem bifihem yir tu sela Kasson nishol shatu Mavet yir aim Vayir du bam yisharim la boker Vituram le baloche o mi vibulo Ah Ach Elohim yifte nafshi miyad she'ol Ki kach eni sela Al tira ki yang shir ish Ki yir bekebot beto Ki lo bemoto yikach hakol Lo yered achera achariv kebodo Ki nafsho bechayav yibarek Vioducha ki te tibla, tabo nador abotav, nadnesach lo iru or, adam bikar vilo yabin, nimshal ka behemot nidmu. That is a unique melody, a simple chant, but we don't use that chant for anything else other than this psalm in the house of mourning before our beat. <coughs> and then the last thing I'm going to do for you is the, what's called the Beit Abel melody, which is the mode for prayers in the house of mourning, which is done whenever you have prayers in the house of mourning, whether it's Mimcha, or on occasion if someone has Shafrit, or, uh, or Arbit. And this is the same melody that is used as on Tisha B'Av here in Sharat Israel. 
So even if you've never been to it, made a Shiva visit uh, to anyone, uh, you will probably have heard this melody if you have been to Tisha B'Av. And um, I could show it to you in different places, but uh, let's see where I'll show it to you. Um, I'm going to the backwards. Um, okay, we'll, we'll do it here. We already did Vuhurachum before you. It's the same, 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 same melody. Vuhurachum yichaper ngavon velo yashvit Vir balashi bapo velo yang yir kol chamato Adonai oshina Hamelech yang aneinu v'yom koreinu Barechu et amonai hamevora Baruch and so on. So it's this sort of um, uh, mournful chant that's done in the house of the Abel, as well as when we're in mourning for the temple of Jerusalem. That is my, uh, my spiel. There's a lot more I could talk about. I've kept you long enough. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, and like I say, I would like to, um, I would like to have a fuller course on customs of mourning uh, and and funeral services uh, because they are interesting uh, and unique. Uh, so, thank you all. I hope you don't have any need for these services or these liturgies, but they are available, uh, and I like to upkeep the, those minhagim whenever possible. I'm going to stop the recording, and you can uh, ask questions if you.